tonight's meeting that they can find the same information that you get from attending by going to our website. So um, anyway, I have started the recording and with that we will we'll jump right in. My name is Amy Birch and I'm a traffic engineer and uh, consultant that works with NDOT to uh, help facilitate the neighborhood street traffic calming program. Um, and so I also have another consultant, George, on the call with us, and he's going to help me uh, monitor the chat box as we go along, make sure I answer any questions that we, that you all have. Um, and as we go along, if you have questions, you can ask them. I will pause um, as, as we get to um, more of the propo pro uh, proposed uh, projects to give you time to ask questions, but you can also feel free to put them in the chat box and we will answer those as those come in. Um, so thank you all for being here. We're here to talk about Donna K Drive and Tampa Drive and the uh, traffic calming project that NDOT is planning to do on these streets. So we're gonna start with some background information about the program. Uh, we'll talk about um, how your street got streets got selected and uh, the toolbox that we have in this program that we use to target uh, speeding and, and get slower speeds on residential streets. And then we'll talk about the uh, proposed plans for these two streets and um, the next steps. All right, so what uh, is traffic calming in uh, the neighborhood street traffic calming program? We focus on residential streets, streets like your two streets, Donna Kay and Tampa. And um, the idea is that we install or uh, design physical solutions that encourage lower speeds over the length of the street. Um, and so we're really targeting speed reduction with, with this program. We often talk about the three E's of traffic calming being education, enforcement, and engineering. Um, education, uh, the department does uh, lots of things to educate the public about um, the benefits of driving slower um, on all Nashville streets. Um, we also do the education through this, um, this meeting and, and uh, giving you all information about traffic calming uh, and what it does and how to drive through it and so forth. And also, um, then enforcement is the job that the police department does. We we know that they that that's a big job and the police department can't possibly be on every residential street 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so that's where NDOT comes in with the engineering piece. So how do we modify and change the street or the street design to um, target and get slower speeds? And this is really our why. Um, why do we want slower speeds? We, because we know there's a great correlation between speeding and safety and a pedestrian's um, ability to survive if they were um, struck by a vehicle. So this this graph is just showing some uh, information about uh, and data about um, speed and that chance of survival. So at 25 miles per hour, um, a pedestrian has an 89 chance for 89% uh, chance of survival. But as that goes up to say 45 miles per hour, that chance of survival goes down to 35%. And so, as you can see, there's um, a correlation between severity of crashes um, with speed. Also, I'd say that um, crashes can be more easily avoided if uh, drivers are driving slower on streets. So then the crash doesn't happen at all because you're able to react. You have a longer time to react and longer time to slow down to avoid the collision altogether. But if they do occur at slower speeds, they're much less severe. Um, so that's why we're trying to get these speeds slower. Um, this is a neighborhood street application program, meaning that um, streets apply for the traffic calming program. And as of um, last end of summer, uh, we had over 500 neighborhood streets that had applied for this program. And um, this particular selection of these that these two streets were in that batch, uh, the summer 2023 selection, uh, NDOT selected 85 neighborhood streets for traffic calming. Um, and typically 
it's a, a lower number that's selected, but there was an additional surplus budget that was um, allocated to the neighborhood street traffic calming program, which added an additional um, 60 streets to the to the selection. So we typically would have uh, selected 25 based on available budget, um, but because of that additional budget, it was 85 that last round. So outside the, the uh, traffic calming program, there's uh, ways to reach uh, different departments within Metro through Hub Nashville. If you're not familiar with it, it's an awesome um, uh, tool that uh, you can submit a request and it gets disseminated to the right uh, department to answer that question or issue, such as maybe a street light's been uh, out or uh, signs been knocked down or storm drain is clogged, things like that, um, non-emergent uh, issues. It's also where if you uh, think there's new signage that's needed or new signals um, needed, you can access that. So it's not just NDOT, it's all departments within Metro and uh, you can reach it by dialing 311. There's an app you can download to your smartphone or visit hub.nashville.gov and um, reach that and it, so you get this uh, a request number and so it's an easy way to follow up as well but it gets it to the right person that can resolve or answer the question that you need so back to traffic calming um i told you that we had uh over 500 streets that had requested traffic calming so how did we get down to that uh number that was selected we have a data-driven traffic calming prioritization which is based on uh, these five main criteria or five criteria and um, and they're weighted differently, but we look at vehicular speed. We go out and we measure the speeds on all the streets that have requested traffic calming. Um, and we compare that to our desired speed of 25 miles per hour. And so that's worth 45% of the score. We also are measuring the volume when we measure the speed. So that is uh, worth 25% of the score. Um, and so we're looking at what that daily traffic volume is. We also look at other things like uh, non-driver accommodations, whether or not there's sidewalks on the street. And therefore, if there's not sidewalks, you know, we know that those pedestrians and people are going to be uh, sharing the road with, um, with vehicles. So we look at lack of sidewalks, whether or not there are bikeways or greenways uh, on or near the street or bus routes where we would expect pedestrians to be going to and from the bus routes and the bus stops. So that's worth 15% of the score. Uh, we look at trip destinations as that bottom one worth 5% of the score. And we're looking at whether or not there are places where we would expect people from this that live on the street to be walking to and from like schools, libraries, parks and community centers, those type of things. And then we also look back at 10 years worth of data and whether there has been a pedestrian or bicyclist injury or fatality uh, or crash on the street. Um, and that's 10% uh, of the score. So all the streets that have applied for traffic calming, we uh, score them based on this um, uh, these criteria and the ones that are, are score the highest are the ones that demonstrate the greatest need for traffic calming and also uh, traffic calming that um, need for the devices and tools that we have in our program are applicable to. So um, those are the ones that are selected and we based on the budget that's available at that time. So within uh, these two streets, and I should say we've looped uh, group these two streets together. They're 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 somewhat close um, in order to be efficient with Metro's budget to um, also council members and so forth as we meet with neighborhoods um, to be efficient with time. And and we know that these are close together, so we think that they um, are okay to have these meetings jointly. So on Donna K Drive, I want to share with you some of the information um, that we collected on these two streets. So on Donna K Drive, we measured the 85th percentile speed to be 35 miles per hour, where the speed limit is 25 miles per hour. Um, and so the 85th percentile speed is a measurement that we traffic engineers often reference um, 
it, it to and it tells us kind of what the prevailing speeds on the street are. Um, and what it really means is that 85% of the traffic that we measured over the course of the day was going 35 miles per hour or below. And it also means on the flip side that 15% of the traffic was going above 35 miles per hour. So that's just a metric that we, we often look at when we are trying to determine if there's a speeding issue or, or, or not. Um, so then the daily volume was about 2,300 vehicles per day. That's the, um, the combination of both directions of travel um, throughout the 24 hour period. Then the street width is about 30 feet wide. There's center line markings and um, there's sidewalk on one side of the street on Donna K. And the street as well as Tampa are considered local streets. And then on Tampa, the, um, on the right side of your screen, um, Tampa, and we're looking at the section of between Harding Place and Wallace Road, the, um, the 85th percentile speed we measured was 36 miles per hour. Speed limit also is 25 miles per hour. The daily volume was just under 2,000 vehicles per day. And then the street width is about uh, 30 feet uh, wide as well with no markings on it, uh, except for right at the intersection at um, Harding Place. And there's no sidewalks on, on Tampa Drive. And, and like I said, it's also considered a local street. So this is a map um, showing our um, kind of limits of our project. And I've circled these two streets that we're working on in, uh, in red there for you. So, um, and this map, the base map is taken from the, um, the program's uh, online tracker map that we use to identify where a, a, a street is in the program, whether we just have an application on file, it's not been selected. Um, those are the, the streets listed or shown in pink that you might see nearby on this map. Uh, we also are showing the streets that have um, completed uh, various types of traffic calming, whether they have vertical measures or not, um, whether, whether they're in the construction queue waiting for construction that's uh street like um wallace down um that intersects with tampa that street is uh gone through this process and is in the construction queue uh these two streets we, we've identified that are in the meeting and design phase and we'll go over more of that uh what our next steps are to get to the uh towards construction we'll talk about that but um so this is just to give you a perspective of the limits of our project so Donna K is between uh, Paragon Mills Road and Paragon Drive to the north, and Tampa is between Harding Place and uh, Wallace Road. So let's talk about our toolkit, um, what we are using to achieve slower speeds on residential streets. Our main tool that we use are called speed cushions. These are hump-like devices that are installed into, onto the roadway. They're drilled into the pavement, um, and they're made of uh, rubber. And the difference between what we typically call a hump um, and a cushion is that it offers these uh, gaps between the devices that um, accommodates emergency vehicle response better, and they, that those larger vehicles have slightly wider wheelbases and therefore aren't as impacted by the um, by the uh, vertical device. But we like these also because we can configure them in a multitude of different arrangements, as you can see in these various pictures I'm showing here, um, depending on the width of the street, the, the pavement striping on the street, whether or not there are bike lanes or not, um, we can configure them in, in several different ways. Um, also shown in these pictures is that they have uh, markings on the devices themselves, showing arrows or center lines if that's um, the case, so that they um, are visible at night, those markings are visible at night. We use the um, warning signs as shown in that picture on the top left to let drivers know of those uh, speed cushions that they're approaching those speed cushions and they're paired with an advisory speed of 20 miles per hour. 
That picture on the left is showing the profile view from the side of a um, typical speed cushion. So you can see they kind of rise as you go over them, have a little flat piece at the top, and then they slope downward. But at their tallest, they're three inches high. They're six feet wide, um, which is wider than the uh, wheelbase of a passenger vehicle or a pickup truck. Um, and then they, depending on the, the street, will configure them in lengths as you travel over them in seven feet, 10 and a half feet, or 14 feet, typically. Um, sometimes we'll use those white flexible um, posts that are shown in that picture on the bottom right um, to either protect the bikeway or just for whatever reason, keep drivers from trying to go around the device because we want to pre uh, prevent that behavior. Um, so the most comfortable way to drive over them is straight over with both wheel, you know, wheels either on one device or um, on two. If it's if it's a configuration like the bottom right, um, as you're driving in the lane, you would have one wheel on either um, cushion within that lane. So when we install these, we're looking at a lot of things um, as far as or when we lay out the design, we look at a lot of um, different factors like where the driveways are. We don't put them right behind a driveway because we don't want um, uh, residents and property owners to be driving over them sideways, trying to get in and out of their driveway and that being a nuisance. So we look at driveways, spacing and locations. We are also looking at um, uh, street intersections. We're not placing them in the middle of intersections. Um, and then grade and horizontal curve. So if we have um, hills, we, we have to avoid um, certain uh, steep grades and as well as um, curvature, um, like curves in the road, we, we have to avoid that area as well. We're also, um, when we install these, we are spacing them and putting them in the series. So, we're not just putting one, one set on the street and that's it. And, and, and because we know that drivers will probably continue their same behavior, maybe slow down fast, drive over one, and then they know there's not another set. So they just pick up their speed again and, and are um, continuing in their same behavior. We place them in, in a series such that they're somewhere around 400 or 500 feet apart. So the drivers even can almost can see and know that there's another cushion not far away. So they continue a um, steady speed along the length of the street. So speed tables are made of the same uh, material as the speed cushions. The difference it largely is that they don't have the gaps um, that the speed cushions have, so they don't have that um, better accommodation for emergency vehicles. Um, and we will typically use these on higher classification streets that still have volumes that are lower. Um, so we don't use these quite as often as the cushions. NDOT has done some before and after studies to determine what has been the effect of um, the installation of traffic uh, calming specifically speed cushions um, on uh, streets here. Um, and so just want to share some of that information because it, it shows very clearly that these are effective uh, tools. Um, so the uh, graph on the left is the average speed comparison, the before and the after. So before um, this uh, uh, the installation, the average speed was 31 miles per hour. And then after the speed cushions were installed on these six streets that were studied, um, the average speed went down to 22 miles per hour. Uh, and then the graph on the right is that 85th percentile speed that I talked about earlier. Um, so the before was 37 miles per hour, and then the after was uh, 25 miles per hour. So, uh, really showing that uh, these are effective um, and we're measuring the, this measurement between sets of cushions, not like right at or on the cushion even. So we're, we're um, making sure that 
we're achieving what we're targeting here with the installation. We also use radar feedback signs, um, and these are signs typically placed with a speed limit sign that um, is a, um, a lit up sign that will uh, flash your speed at you as, as you're driving and approaching the sign um, on that street. And if your speed is above the posted speed limit, it will flash. Um, these are typically radar, I mean, uh, excuse me, um, solar powered. So, you know, we look for places that are, um, that have good sun exposure so that they're powered all the time. That's often a, um, a, a challenge uh, on residential streets that are shaded. But um, anyway, these are also very um, effective or have been shown to be effective in some studies that NDOT has done um, showing an average speed reduction of six miles per hour and average 85th percentile speed reduction of um, seven miles per hour. We'll typically use these in places that um, for um, that we can't use um, the vertical devices because of um, vertical grade or horizontal curvature that prohibits the use of those other um, tools or um, on, on streets, you, you've probably seen them on streets that maybe have uh, higher volume than those that uh, qualify for this type of uh, traffic calming program. So we've deployed them there and um, they have shown to have some lasting effects on driver behavior. We we'll also utilize uh, pavement markings to narrow the travel way, make, um, which makes drivers feel a little more constrained um, and uh, slow down. Uh, sometimes there's extra shoulder width. Sometimes that's um, uh, not through the traffic calming program, but extra width could be um, turned into bike lanes or so forth. We usually um, We'll add just the white edge lines, particularly on streets that already have the center line. We might add the white edge line to to form um, narrower travel lanes, uh, like 10 foot lanes, as opposed to 12 or 14 foot lanes that may be there without the white line. Another um, use of paint uh, and signs and markings is creating bulb outs. Um, and chicanes. The picture on the left is an uh, image of bulb outs, which is narrowing the pavement width, designating maybe where the parking uh, stops or starts. It narrows the crossing distances for um, crosswalks and pedestrians. Uh, we will utilize those uh, white flexible delineator posts to um, prohibit drivers from driving into that area and just tighten up the intersection altogether. Um, and restrict that parking back uh, away from the intersection. Um, and these are, you know, useful in uh, intersections that are wide or streets that are wide. It's not always applicable if we have a narrow street. Then uh, chicanes, similarly, these are typically uh, for streets that are pretty wide. Um, and in these pictures, what's happening is the street's wide enough for parking on one side of the street. Um, I believe it also has a bike lane, but what's happening is the, the on-street parking is shifting from side to side, creating a horizontal deflection in the um, travel lane so that drivers are having to slow down in order to stay in the lane and um, negotiate through that um, more curvy road where otherwise it was a straight street. Again, you know, you have to have the right width of street, the use of parking or or something like that in order to create these um, this horizontal um, deflection for the street, but it's a tool that we have used. Traffic circles are intersection um, traffic calming devices where we'll create a circular island in the middle of an intersection. It, um, creates a horizontal deflection for uh, drivers as they drive through the intersection. Um, and it's kind of like a roundabout in that you, you know, circulate around the intersection to make a left turn, you'll go counterclockwise. Um, the um, 
you know, all the right existing design features need to be there in order for this to kind of work at an intersection. You know, it needs to be kind of a wide intersection that we can put this in there. Um, but we have done this um, at several intersections in the city. Um, and another thing is, you know, it's just at an intersection. If we have a series of intersections, sometimes that's really good. Um, if we can get that consistent, you know, um, treatment at several intersections, that kind of creates that calming um, behavior throughout the length of the street. All right, so those are our tools that we have in our toolbox for this program. Um, now I'm showing, uh, we're going to start with Donna Kay and then we'll talk about Tampa. Um, but now I'm showing our concept plan for Donna Kay. Um, so just to orient you before we uh, dive right into it, to orient you um, north is to the right of the screen. And so um, Paragon Mills is on the left side going north-south, um, so that's one end of the street uh, segment that we're doing the project on, and then uh, Paragon Drive is to the right of the screen. And so Donna Kay is in the, is highlighted in this pinkish purple line. Um, but what we are recommending for um, Donna Kay is four sets of speed cushions along this segment. So two pretty close to um, Paragon Mills School, elementary school. And then as you go further, um, another two sets. So a set between um, um, Scottwood and then Eckert. And then uh, a set between Eckert and Paragon Drive. Um, so the picture on the left, uh, at the top left, is kind of showing that configuration that we would um have on this street based on the width of the street and um, the striping pattern on the street which is um, a set of three cushions wide um, and again we would pair these with the um, speed cushion uh, warning signs so that those are visible um, as you're approaching the device and this is these are spaced about 400 feet apart. There's a slightly wider section between cushion two and three, um, but that's uh, that's pretty much our goal is to try to get them in, in a series of about 400 feet wide. Um, so I might pause there and see if there are any questions about this plan, um, and what we're proposing here. Feel free to put those in the chat box, or you can unmute yourself and ask questions if you have any. Um, the question is, does it continue past Eckert? Yes, it goes between Eckert and Paragon Drive. That is, Paragon Drive is the limit of our project. It's between Paragon Mills Road and Paragon Drive. So there is one set. Um, proposed in that uh, block, one block between Eckert and Paragon Drive. Okay. Well, I'll, um, if there's not any other questions, I'll go on to Tampa. And then, of course, if you have any other questions, um, type in the chat box or, or ask. Uh, you can unmute and ask, but we'll we'll move on. So um, Tampa Drive uh, to orient you. I'm showing that signal symbol there at Harding. So north is to the right. We've kind of turned the um, aerial here, but uh, north is to the right of the screen, and then Wallace is uh, the intersection there with the stop sign. Um, so this is a shorter street segment. Um, and, and also there is significant grade and hill between, uh, Harding and Largo drive, uh, as you're probably well aware of. Um, and so, like I said earlier, we're unable to put the vertical devices on that steep hill there. Um, so what we are recommending is some edge line striping along the whole length of the street. They're, 
um, and uh, between the section on Largo and Harding to add that center line or continue the center line. Right now it stops just at um, the uh, turn lane. So we continue that on and really narrow those lanes there between Largo and, and Harding. And then between Wallace and Largo, there's two sets of cushions spaced about 400 feet apart um, there. And um, with the edge line striping, we would do a set of three wide uh, speed cushions like shown in the picture in the top left. Um, so I think I'll pause there. Hey, Amy, we have a question in the chat. Oh, good. Yes. Um, so the question is um, whether, let's see, Jeffrey Drive, why wasn't the project extended to Jeffrey Drive? Um, So that so this program uses the applications to identify where the limits of our projects were. So that was the section that was applied for traffic calming. So that was the section that we we're doing um, for this project. Um, question is: Since there are no sidewalks on Tampa and the street is 30 feet wide, could you stripe a walking path on one side with paint and delineators? Uh, we could we could consider looking at that. The um, the tight part, you know, gets down to um, or up to the uh, intersection at Harding where the where the turn lane develops. So then that would kind of um, taper out. But we can look at that. And, and see if there's something we can do there. I have a question from Kesha. Keisha. Keisha, thank you. Yes, okay, so what, what are you saying is, if in order for Jeffrey to be considered, I have, we have to apply for the next round? Yes. Okay, okay. Because I see Eisenhower has it in sunlight, so that's why I was wondering why they stop right at Jeffrey, and they speed all the way down Donna K, all the way across the stop sign. Um, right, right. We we typically go with um, and unless there's something that stands out to the department, um, we typically do the project limits that are um, applied for, and that and that was what was requested. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, the question, another question is, how do we get Tampa extended to the other side of Tampa? Um, that is something, um, I'm not sure if council member is on the call. I don't think so. Um, there, I believe that Tampa, um, on the other side of Harding has been identified as a um, project under the um, under the participatory budgeting um, process. It was identified as a project there, so there may be a traffic calming project coming for that side of Tampa. But this was already this project was already um, moving forward and and selected last um, last August for this section of Tampa. Um, okay, let's see. Next question. When are the next round of applications? Um, the next round will be in September. We had a um, application window between March 1st and 14th that closed um, recently. And um, so the next application window will be in September. Have we seen data that suggests that these traffic calming measures make aggressive driving and speeding worse on the streets that don't have those measures? Uh, we don't have any hard data on that um, question, no. Um, sorry. That is certainly not the goal of this program. Um, 
to to push traffic or to to, to uh, other streets or anything like that. But um, you know, it it may happen. But we don't have any we don't have any data about that. Are there any other questions or any other um, comments about these two proposed plans and concepts? Uh, question is there a way to report aggressive driving before September? Uh, absolutely. If you have um, a situation of aggressive driving, you know, call the um, non emergency number um, for the police department to um, ask for some uh, enforcement that can happen. We also have a uh, speed trailer program, which is kind of like the radar feedback sign that we um, show showed pictures of earlier where it you can apply for the speed trailer program and uh indot will install that um in on streets for about a week and it, it will uh show drivers their their speed speed as they approach and flash if they're going above the posted speed limit um yes those those two avenues are there um if there are other issues you can put them in the hub um Let's see, another question has come in. Uh, will there also be signage added to watch for pedestrians if they don't already exist? Lots of students walk this road to Paragon Mills and the hills make it difficult for drivers to see anyone uh, in the road over those grades. Um, I would, I'll report that back to uh, NDOT myself um, about uh, the desire to add some uh, pedestrian warning signage on these streets. And uh, you can also put that in the hub and make that request if you want to um, follow up on that. But yes, that um, is something that can, it's not really traffic calming, but uh, we re recognize this is kind of an avenue for you to make these, for the community to reach the department and ask these questions. So I'll, uh, I'll share that. Um, with the team. Okay, when will these projects be completed? I'll um, move on to my next slide and we can come back to these plans uh, if needed, but I will move on and uh, probably try to answer that question. So this is our program flow chart where um, kind of show you how you move through the program. Um, it starts with an application that I talked about. We have two cycles per year. The next one will be in September. Um, where residents can apply for traffic calming. Then we do our uh, data collection and prioritization process to identify which streets uh, scored the highest, uh, meaning that they have the greatest need for traffic calming. And those are the streets that are then selected. And we work with um, our neighborhood contacts and council members to set up and schedule uh, neighborhood meetings, which is what we're doing right now. Um, and um, these meetings are advertised with postcards that are mailed to the property owners uh, on the streets within the within the zone that we're working in. Um, we give this overview of the program, the toolbox, and the draft uh, concepts, uh, and talk about next steps. Uh, from here, we will take the concept that we're, we've shown you that's um, and and develop it into a more uh, uh, detailed design, um, laying out exactly where the cushions go on the street. We'll do a field review and measure those grades to make sure um, that we're uh, putting them in safe places and they're visible and they're spaced appropriately and lay in the road correctly. Um, and, and all the signage and any other uh, details that go with it, like pavement markings, will all be on the design. So we'll develop that. Um, and then if, at, and then from there, we would go into the online ballot um, phase. And I have more details about the balloting I'll show on the next couple of slides, but basically there's a process within this program in which NDOT wants to make sure that there's support 
for this uh, investment on these residential streets. Um, so we, we send out um, postcards to ask for um, property owners to vote on the project. And then if the vote is favorable, meaning it's 66% in favor of the project, then it would move into the construction phase. Um, so from here, if we felt like we needed a second neighborhood meeting, um, we could do that after our plan is uh, designed. Sometimes we uh, go to neighborhood streets in these meetings and have um, you know some modifications, some major modifications that need to happen to the plan, um, and we would need to present that again to the neighborhood so that we um, take the feedback that we have during this meeting and incorporate that in the plan and present it again. But if if that's not necessary, we don't need to have a second meeting. So we'll kind of talk more about that um, in, in a minute uh, before we wrap up to kind of decide where we are with this the, these two neighborhood streets. But if there's not made, you know, it's, it's rare, but sometimes we will present a plan that includes speed cushions and the neighborhood, neighborhood really doesn't want them. Um, and so we might need to retool the plan and, and put something else together. Um, so that's typically when we will have a second neighborhood meeting, but um, in order to be efficient and move the project along as fast as we can, we don't need necessarily have to have a second meeting. Um, so from here, you know, we have a couple months in, in design, then um, the ballot is um, a couple months long uh, period of time, and then the construction is about eight months. So from here, we're looking at about one year uh, from installation, give or take a few months. We do struggle with, um, you know, just keeping up with it and uh, getting the contractor um, going, weather dependent, all of that. You know, winter months uh, can sometimes. Um, Add delay, but that's our goal is is uh, within 12 months to be installed. So let me talk about hey, the Amy. ballots. Yes. Yeah, sorry to cut you off. We do have a few questions in regards to the ballots. Uh, yes. I'm maybe answering those as I go through these. Will the ballots just be shared to those on Tampa? Um, to wondering about how far the outreach goes to ensure those down streets like Largo, for example, would get the notice. Okay, I'm going to address that in this uh, in both streets. Yes, I will address that with these next two slides. Um, so the balloting is an online vote um, and ballot, uh, and so the access to the vote is sent via mailers, and the mailers will have unique IDs in the bottom right corner. Um, and those are kind of correlated to um, each property. So it's unique for each property. Then the, the voting is open for six weeks um, and the closing date will be on the top of the mailer card you will receive in the mail. Um, and so that way you know when it closes and when to start looking for the results. So there's a lot of information on the card about, you know, uh, the, the about the balloting process, about the ballot zone, and so forth. But re respondents can vote yes or no for the project. And then um, if 66% of the respondents vote yes, then the project will move forward. So it's not necessarily that we need 66% of all the properties on the street to vote yes, though we would love that um, voter turnout and participation. It's 66% of the respondents if that vote if they vote yet, if it's 66 or percent of or above, then it will move forward. Um, so the bottom left image is just kind of this, um, the uh, top of the ballot online ballot snapshot from the website. So you can kind of see what that looks like. There's also a link to the plan to the final plan that you'll be able to view. So anyone that's not necessarily familiar with um, the the program or the project or whatever, if they get that uh, postcard in the mail, they're interested, want to learn about what the plan is, they have an opportunity to, to click on that uh, link and see the plan for that particular street. 
There's also uh, on this postcard a phone number to reach NDOT if for whatever reason someone is unable to vote online. Um, they can reach someone and, and receive some help with that. Um, but it's a QR code at the top of the postcard that takes you to that online ballot form. So the ballot zone and the um, it is shown in these yellow. So Donna K is on the top left, and then there's Tampa uh, in the middle of the screen. Um, so the program policy is that residential properties churches and schools each get one vote um, so it's one vote per property um, and only those properties that are abutting the affected right away are eligible to vote um, on the project so owners there sometimes there may be owners that own multiple uh, properties along the length of the street owners with multiple properties just get one vote we do not um, take votes from vacant properties, so those are ineligible and businesses are ineligible um, to vote. So those are the eligible um, properties along these two streets for um, the ballot, and those are the um, property owners that will receive the postcard. So um, also the, the postcards are mailed to the property owner addresses. Um, so, if it happens to be a company in Nebraska that owns the property, that's where that postcard goes. Um, and so, did I think I answered your question about um, wondering how far the outreach goes. So, this, the properties along Largo or any of the other side streets do not um, get that um, notice or, or ballot postcard um, corner. Corner properties do so. A corner property might have an address that's a side street, but they have some frontage on one of these streets that the project is on, and so those are eligible for voting. Um, how can I get the Donna K proposed speed bump location? So that will be on um, the speed cushion locations. Will be on the um, final plan. But I will go back to that plan um, to just show the general location. So it'll be um, starting with the cushion set on the left. So it'll be between that uh, house on the corner um, and Atkins Drive. And then there'll be another set uh, just um, north of the school property line um, is, is the location of a set. And then there's a set between Scottwood and Eckert Drive, um, kind of midway between there. And again, we avoid um, driveways. So that goes into play both sides of the street. We're, we're avoiding uh, driveways. So um, that kind of often dictates exactly where we can put it. Uh, we don't want to be too close to driveways. Um, and then the fourth set is um, between Eckerd and uh, Paragon Drive, um, just about one house in it, or one house south of Paragon Drive. Um, another question is: Will it be in multiple languages? Um, no, uh, typically it is not uh, in multiple languages. But I think um, if there is. Uh, a need for some assistance that can be provided by NDOT. Um, the next question is, so renters don't get a vote at all. Um, the, the postcards are mailed to the property owner, owner addresses. Um, if there are renters that are interested in the project, they're absolutely encouraged to communicate with um, the property owners to um, Voice their opinion and 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 uh, about the vote, but um, that's just the um, NDOT's policy is that the the ballot postcards are mailed to the the property owner addresses. Um, since we are a school, can we communicate with the families who uh, live around us? That's one of that's the next question. In the chat box, um, meaning, um, 
Absolutely. We would love for anyone on this call or on the street to, um, to, you know, contact your neighbors or, or talk to your neighbors and make sure you, um, uh, where make them aware of the project and, um, for them to be looking for the postcards so that they, um, vote or rem remind them to vote. Um, on, on this project and. Since we are a school, can we communicate with the families who live around us often who are renters with language barriers? Yeah, can I just speak to that? So yes. this is Britt Sykes. I'm the assistant principal at Paragon Mills. We have a lot of our concerns of our families coming to us because they are all walkers and drivers and they live in the school. And as you know, there's concern because of the lack of sidewalks. Since many of them are renting, they won't be getting the postcard. And they also have language barriers because they're still learning English. So, well, my question is, can we advocate for them and give them the link and help them advocate for themselves if they are the renters or like, will yes. they be able to vote? That's the, that's the question. So technically, you know, they're not going to be able to um, vote directly because they won't be maybe receiving the postcard. Okay. You can absolutely, you know, help them advocate for themselves, ask, you know, tell them that it's um, the project is ongoing and perhaps they can contact the uh, owner of the property to um, ask them to vote in favor or against the project, you know, whatever their um, the choice is. But um, yes, absolutely. Okay, so then they would have to contact the landlord and have the landlord vote. They cannot vote themselves. That's the way the program is set up, correct? Okay. So I will move on in the program. I wanted to share my contact information and NDOT's traffic calming uh, email, NDOTTrafficCalming at Nashville.gov. My name again, Amy Birch, Amy Birch at birchtransportation.com. Um, and so before we wrap up, um, certainly want to um, make sure we've answered it, all the questions, but um, if the uh, it wanted to tr try to find out or gauge whether anyone thought we needed to have a second meeting, I based on the feedback I've heard, I don't think we would need to have a second meeting, but we were all always open to doing that. Um, you know, it takes you know time to schedule and so forth. I haven't heard anything that would significantly change either of these two plans um, such that we would present different information. It would just be a more vetted out plan that um, would be more zoomed in to show those locations. But that is kind of the extent of the changes that I think you might see um, or more information that might be presented again. So if anyone thinks we need to have a second meeting, please um, you know, speak up or put it in the chat box, let me know. But um, I'm not thinking that that's necessarily needed. Uh, and in the meantime, um, one more question has come in. If it's a complex, they would contact who the company. It's not just one person, I assume. Um, so if it's a complex, so I think most of these properties on both of these streets are single family um like parcels single family um homes so i think um each one of those properties would receive a a vote on the um on the plan so um but yeah if, if the property is owned by a company and it's rented the renter could certainly reach out to that company to ask for um, ask for them to vote 
in the favor that the renters is um, asking for. But that's that's really all I think I can say about that. Um, so we don't really have a a formalized policy for something outside of the the way it's written, which is that the votes are um, the postcards are sent to the property owners. Um, so Meredith from uh, Walk Bike, can we see the plans for a potential walking path on Tampa? I think we can share that if if that's something that we can um, incorporate in to the plan. Um, we can we can um, share that either with another meeting or outside of that. Um, but it would be shown on the plan that's posted to the website. We post the final plans to the website before the ballots are sent out. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm sure and would be happy to work with uh, walk bike on that. If um, it's something we can incorporate into this plan. So I'll um, maybe reach out to NDOT and just and you know figure out how we how we would go about doing that and and we can share that. Okay. So not seeing anyone that needed that thought we needed to. Um, at an at a second meeting, I think we'll wrap up and um, we'll take this feedback that we've heard about the uh, pedestrian signs. I uh, wanted to add that to that area as well as possibility of um, using that extra width on the street on um, Tampa for more of a walking path as opposed to a um, um, just more narrow white edge line on either side. Maybe the, the width is allocated um, differently. So the drive lane is on one side and then a walking path on, on just one side of the street. So uh, we will um, work on that and see if we can incorporate that into the plan. Um, and then we'll, what happens is we typically will contact a council member and our uh, resident neighborhood contact for each street and let them know that the um, the plans are posted and the ballot postcards are being mailed out so they can know to expect them, communicate to neighbors uh, um, to look out for that. But we try to do that relatively quickly within the next uh, couple of months so that this information is um, not forgotten and not not lost, and you yeah you, you get a timely response on that. So we will work to finalize that those two plans and and get those moving along. Um, and so I'm showing here a QR code that takes you to the traffic calming website on uh, NDOT's website. That's where we post um, the results from ballots. So, like I said, the um, the Ballot postcard will have a closing date, so a couple of days after that, you'll be able to go to the website and see what the results are um, from the website. We don't post individual voting results, of course, but um, just the the uh, end tally, like 75% in favor or so forth, um, and that it would pass the ballot vote. Um, so that's that information is hosted there, as well as the status of all of our projects uh, within the traffic calming program on that map uh, that I'd shown a snip, snippet of before. Also, uh, all of the final plans are posted to the website. These meeting recordings are posted there. So if you're uh, communicating with um, you know, your neighbor that missed the meeting and they're interested in the project, want to know more, you can uh, direct them to this website and they can find this meeting link and, and get the same information. Um, our manuals there, more information about all of our tools in our toolbox and so forth. So a lot of great information. Um, on this website um, that NDOT has. Uh, and these are NDOT social channels. If you follow along, um, there's been a lot of uh, speed cushion installations going on the last few weeks. And um, so they've been posting about those. 
And we have one last comment. We really need a safe place for kids to walk on Tampa. So whatever you can do. Understood. Understood. We, we do have that issue on many, many residential streets, unfortunately, without sidewalks, but um, I appreciate you sharing that information. So with that, I'll wrap up unless there's any other questions. Um, be glad to answer them, but I think we will move forward, finalize these two plans and um, get those ballot postcards sent out. So look for those in the mail. And thank you all for your time this evening. Thanks, Amy. Have a good evening. Good night.